graphics card prices are depressing right now, aren't they? Before Ryzen came out in 2017, there was stagnation in the processor market. You could have a 4-core i5 for £150 or a 4-core i7 for £250. Take your pick. It was the same thing every year with minor improvements. But at least all those processors were good, and at least Intel's pricing was consistent. There have been a few occasions in the past when RAM prices have gone through the roof. Anybody looking to build a new PC at the time had to spend hundreds of pounds on the RAM itself, being one of the most boring components. At least throwing the money out of the window you'd see the scrabbling mass, the hate-filled faces. All those times when the prices increased, it felt like we'd never return to the good times again. But we eventually did. These days it's the graphics card market that depresses me, and it feels like we'll never return to the good times again. And it's not the same as it was with the processors, because there's still progress. Faster graphics cards are coming out with every generation, but we have to pay for it. And not just hundreds, but thousands of pounds. And in a way that's even worse. Don't get me wrong, I love what these new cards can do, especially with ray tracing. That stuff is exciting. But I've absolutely lost any interest in following the hardware scene itself when the prices are so uncompetitive, because that's where a lot of my joy used to come from. Like even when I wasn't looking to buy, I used to love seeing new hardware coming out, offering more performance for less money than ever before. That was what thrilled me, that feeling of constant progress. After Ryzen's launch, I frequent the AMD subreddit on a daily basis to check out the new reviews, releases and cool tests people had done on these things to show how much more you could get at that price point than ever before. It was a huge leap, but when prices stop dropping, my interest dries up. My passion for technology has been fuelled by the idea that you could get a better system with your money today than you could have done yesterday, and without that it saddens me. If you don't need a new graphics card, now is actually a very good time to buy a new PC. It's been years since the processor market was this exciting. At the high end, the Ryzen 7950X is the undisputed champion, and this is coming from me, someone with a 13900K. It's still a beastly processor, but the 7950X's improved efficiency and upgradable platform makes it a better choice. Below that, the Intel 13600K reigns supreme. It isn't cheap, but it's so much performance for its price that it renders many more expensive processors immediately obsolete. Like it competes with the Ryzen 7600X for gaming, the 7700X for productivity, and it gets close enough to the 7900 to make its price premium unappealing. It's been a long time since a single product was so appealing for so many reasons. Below that you have things like the Ryzen 5000 series, which is still a fast budget option for gamers and content creators alike. This is still all the power that you really need. And then you can go really crazy in the ultra low end. I saw a Ryzen 4500 processor for £67 the other day. So what is the budget graphics card market like right now? <laughs> I'm beginning to distrust graphics cards from 2016 as it's reaching a point where they're all well out of warranty, have lived through gruelling crypto mining crazes and they are beginning to fail, as my GeForce 680 and Radeon 470 have already done. So if you're in the market for a budget graphics card, you're still looking at stuff like the GeForce 1650, 1660 and on AMD's side, the Radeon 6400 and 6500. None of these are great options, though I'd like to use this opportunity to praise the 6500 XT again, because it's clear that nobody else will, and I think that's unfair. I noticed that reviewers spend all their time praising fast graphics cards for being fast and then briefly mention how unreasonable the price is at the end somewhere, but with the 6500 XT it's the exact opposite. The entire review is spent slating it for being slow, and then at the end they'll briefly say something like, but at least it's cheap and available. I don't think that was fair. I understand the bitterness about it being a £200 card that was, in many ways, inferior to older £200 cards, but that's entirely missing the point of why the 6500 XT was so important. It came about amidst the most desperate time in the history of graphics cards, at a time when those older £200 cards were no longer available or were still available but for £300, and due to the major crypto boom card shortage, all other new alternatives were £400 and more. And you can't just claim that you should spend £400 on a card because it's the best priced performance you can get. It's a slippery slope, because what happens when the companies start making their most expensive card the best value for money you can get? Where do you draw the line? £600? £1,000? I think a lot of people draw a line at £200, and that's why I found the 600 XT's availability and price point so important. Because many people needing a graphics card aren't doing it for the hell of it. Many needed something cheap to tide them over until things got better, and that's exactly what I saw the 6500 XT as being for. I actually saw buying one as being a win-win, because while the prices of everything remained inflated, then owning the 6500 XT would at least enable you to game in the meantime. And when the prices did eventually crash, your money could then be used to buy a much more powerful card than was possible before the crash. Because it sucks to spend $1000 on a 3060 Ti, only to see half its value wiped a few months later. So no, the 6500 XT was nobody's dream graphics card. It was stripped down, artificially and unnecessarily nerfed. But it was cheap, it remains cheap, 
and it remained available. And yeah, ray tracing. But I bought one of these, and it has worked out perfectly well at LANs for when we've needed an extra graphics card. In some games, it runs very poorly at ultra settings, but then you lower the settings and it can play the games again. So yeah, that's it. I'll shut up about the 6500 XT now. And since prices have dropped quite a bit since then, those looking to buy a gaming PC should definitely try stretching to a Radeon 6600 instead. Intel's Arc graphics could have been a great option, and one day they still might. I was very excited about them before release, and that was because of their three-tier strategy. Tier 1 were games that Arc would be optimised for, and would run well in. Level 2 were less important ones that were still modern games, and then there was Level 3, which were the older games which Intel themselves admitted that Arc wouldn't be very fast at running. But here's the thing, they were going to price these Arc graphics cards relative to their worst gaming performance meaning that at worst they'd still be competitive with similarly priced AMD and Nvidia cards, but at best they'd be significantly faster. However, in practice this didn't really happen. Intel's pricing wasn't enough to justify the terrible state of their drivers. At best, it remained competitive or even outperformed its competitors, but at worst it stuttered or severely underperformed how it should have done in titles. And performance was only half the problem. There were graphical glitches and all sorts of weird exotic problems unseen in the land of graphics cards for decades and all these made the art cards unsuitable for anybody who just wanted to get on and game. Now I understand, making graphics cards is hard, problems are to be expected, and I really hope that Intel continues to improve their hardware and software, because we desperately need a third option in the graphics card market right now, but so far I am yet to be impressed by them in practice. But I remain hopeful that, in a generation or so, Arc could become a great choice of mainstream graphics card. Although I guess it is already, because within months of Arc's launch, a report on dedicated graphics cards sold stated that Intel already had 4% of the entire graphics card market, which makes them half the size of AMD. What the hell? AMD has been fighting for graphics card market share for decades, failing to claim ground from Nvidia, typically blamed for having poor drivers, and now Intel waltzes along and becomes half of AMD's size within months, despite offering very few products and with far worse drivers. Facts are facts, and I think it's safe to say that Intel's on their way to becoming a major competitor in the graphics card market, and that AMD's graphics division is truly cursed. AMD's high-end 7000 series cards have just launched, yet there's no news on their more affordable lineups just yet. I've been underwhelmed by the Radeon 7900 series. The performance of it is fine, the naming scheme questionable, but the pricing is flat out dull, and not enough to make their cards appealing against the already dully priced GeForce 4000 series. All new cards seem to be priced to make the most expensive one look to be the best value for money, and that makes me sad. Not just for now, but for future releases as well. But I will defend the Radeon 7000 series power consumption. People think it isn't power efficient because it's less competitive against Nvidia than previous generations were, but looking through the generations, Nvidia has typically used a larger and less efficient node than AMD has, but with the new GeForce 4000 series they've essentially leapfrogged AMD by moving to an even smaller, arguably more efficient node than AMD is currently using in their hybrid designs. But if you compare AMD against previous AMD cards then it's clear that the 7000 series is still a big improvement. It sees the start of modular graphics chips, which I hope will be scalable and, just like Ryzen, I hope it will pay off in many ways that we're yet to see. And hopefully some of these ways may actually benefit us. Nvidia on the other hand has been slowly rolling out the 4000 series of graphics card from top downwards, starting with the 4090, then the 4080 and now the 4070 Ti series. But it could be a while before we see the lower end, if at all. But what they have done is to reveal their laptop series. Nvidia looks to be in no rush to roll out their desktop cards though but when they do eventually come, I'm sure they'll be impressively power efficient as well. But power efficiency isn't as important as speed, and speed isn't as important as good pricing is. And that is unfortunately the thing that we're all lacking right now. I've kind of put myself in a situation where I now need to suggest to you a budget gaming build. So I proudly present to you the lowest spec system that I would get if my house blew up and I needed to get a system capable of creating YouTube videos again as cheaply as possible. Since it still takes up half the cost of the entire system, we'll start with a graphics card. I'm not betting on finding a good second-hand deal for this video, I'm going by the new options, and despite all my praising of the Radeon 6500 XT, I'm not recommending it here for a number of reasons, but the main one is that these days the 6600 doesn't cost that much more, but does give you a lot more for your money. This time last year it was close to £400, but these days can be had for just over £200 if you shop around. For that you'll be getting an excellent 1080p gaming card, with screen capture support and without any of the limitations that the 6500 XT suffers from. And my choice of the 12100F processor is for lots of reasons, just go with that and be happy. 
But to try and prove some sort of point which I eventually regretted, I did construct this Ryzen 4 500 build, which would have been about £25 cheaper, and I had this long script typed up about how it's still all you need to get things done and how it still manages 60fps minimum frame rates in all games and all that stuff, but there would be so many downsides to doing it that it probably isn't worth it. For a start, few motherboards ship with support for the 4 500 straight out of the box, which believe me, would be a massive pain. Second, if you were to use the Radeon 6500 XT graphics card to cut costs, then at least this 12100F setup would have PCIe 4 support, which would make it perform better than the Ryzen would. And lastly, the Intel build actually has more upgradability than you'd have by using AM4. But I guess the alternative to building your own PC would be if you went with the Steam Deck instead, which is still a really attractive budget gaming option. It won't be anywhere near as fast as even the budget desktop build that I was recommending, but it doesn't need to be. It can still run most games out there, plus it pays off in other ways by being an all-in-one portable device with nice controls and all sorts of interesting quirks and features. Even with all my PCs and powerful hardware, there's still something quite magical about being able to boot up a game when I'm lying in bed or when I'm on the train, able to get back into the action with just the press of a button. The Steam Deck fills all those gaps I never knew existed in my life until I got it. But there's no question about it. The budget gaming scene is depressing right now. Nvidia and AMD show no signs of wanting to fill the £200 price point with an incredible new graphics card, and Intel's offerings still can't do it even if they wanted to. But give it time and who knows.